Do you consider the book of Revelation to be a Chinese puzzle that no one can understand? Is it a book that is frightening to you? Well, don't feel like the Lone Ranger. The book of Revelation is one of the most misunderstood books in the Bible. People often say it's just too difficult to understand. Well, they are wrong. It is not difficult to understand. It is difficult to believe. If you'll believe it, you'll understand it. For the opinions of a panel of Bible prophecy experts, stay tuned. Lamb and Lion Ministries presents Christ in Prophecy, a program that focuses on the fundamentals of Bible prophecy, showing how current events in the news relate to biblical predictions of end time events and the soon return of Jesus. Now, here's your host, Dr. David Reagan. Greetings in the name of Jesus, our blessed hope, and welcome to Christ in Prophecy. As you can see, once again this week, I have a studio full of people, all of whom are experts in Bible prophecy. Returning to it with us from last week's program, our first, Gary Fisher here, uh, who is the founder and director of Lion of Judah Ministries in Franklin, Tennessee. Welcome, Gary. Great to be back, Dave. Thanks. Always good to have you. Thanks. And next to him is my former colleague, Dennis Pollock, who uh, was with me for 11 years here in this ministry before he felt the call of God to establish his own ministry called Spirit of Grace, which focuses on the continent of Africa. Glad to have you, Dennis. Well, thanks, Dave. It's worthwhile just to hear you call me an expert. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> okay. And Nathan? This is my colleague, Nathan Jones, of course. Uh, you're familiar with him. He's the co-host of this program. And Nathan, we're glad to have you with us today. And Appreciate fellows, it. I want to jump right into this uh, thing about uh, the book of Revelation. Let's, let's talk about uh, uh, one of the popular theories today, and that is uh, what's called preterism. Uh, kind of a strange name, but in cert and certainly one of the strangest interpretations of the book of Revelation anybody's ever come up with, but it's growing in popularity. And this is the idea that the book of Revelation was written before 70 A.D. and therefore was fulfilled in whole or in part, some argue in whole, uh, in the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 A.D., that it's a, pro it, it's a book of prophecies about 70 A.D. and not about the end times. What about it? Well, that would mean that Jesus would have had to have come back at 70 A.D. And I don't know about you, but no historian recorded the return of Jesus. But in they argue that He came back spiritually. True. But that would then mean that we're living in the Millennial Kingdom. And I don't know about you, but when I read the Bible about the Millennial Kingdom, we talk about the curse being partially lifted, that <laughs> Jesus is ruling from Jerusalem, that Jerusalem is, is, is the capital city of the world, and Israel is the main country, and that the, the curse is lifted. It's a time of peace and harmony. And with 38 wars going on right now, I don't think this is the millennial Well, kingdom. and also when you talk about him coming back spiritually, you deny what the, what the angels said to his disciples on the Mount of Olives when he ascended into heaven. He will return as he ascended. That's yes. bodily. That's visibly. Yeah. What about it? Uh, this whole argument is based in two issues. One, uh, if you're bent on the interpretation allegorically of the Bible, then you can get away with saying Jesus has already returned and all the plagues and all that stuff has already occurred. But if you insist on the literal, literal interpretation of the Bible, then you cannot get away with that. In fact, if you don't have literal interpretation, there's no way really to ever determine whether a prophecy has been fulfilled. Well, not only that, but the whole Bible becomes almost meaningless oh, yeah. with the allegorical interpretation of the Bible. It can mean anything. Uh, Dennis, how do we know Revelation, there was a real Jesus? Was the book of Revelation written before 70 years? No, it was written after, so that should settle it right there. But <laughs> beyond that, uh, you know, have you ever been to an event that was really built up as something great and it turned out to just fizzle? Oh, yeah. You know, I, I went to one meeting that was supposed to be the latest, greatest revival meetings, you know, going on. And after it was over, I was really disappointed. I thought, Lord, is this the best you can do? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, when you read about the, the coming of Christ, you know, in, at the end of Revelation and riding the white horse, you know, coming as this mighty warrior to take control of the earth, and then you find out it's this little wimpy spiritual coming that really didn't mean much of anything. It's like, is that really what's being described in Revelation? And the answer is obviously no. Yeah. The tribulation is leading up to something. It's not all by itself in Revelation. It's leading up to Christ coming back to rule and reign. And what hope is there about the future if you think it's all fulfilled in 70 A.D.? Yeah, Come it, on. it makes the whole thing meaningless. It, you know what? It reminds, preterists remind me of that statement by Paul where he said, I want you to avoid two fellows, and he named them, because he said they teach that the resurrection has Past. already occurred. Yeah. Well, these guys are teaching the second coming has already <laughs> Yeah. occurred. I mean, it, what hope is there? Yeah, it's really it, a very it's, sad kind of interpretation. I, I, I'm with Nathan's point. Uh, if we are living now in the millennium, we're in a big mess. 
because if this is God's best, with the high, some of the highest crime rates in the world and all the other stuff that's going with that, and this is the millennium? And Satan is supposed to be reined in. He's supposed to be put in a pit yeah. during the millennial kingdom. Obviously, he's working right now. Well, he, he's not in a pit in Tennessee. <laughs> <laughs> he's roaming about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Okay, let's look at another question. What do you consider to be uh, some of the key keys to interpreting and understanding the book of Revelation. Name, name one. I, I just simply say believe it as it is written. Okay. Just believe it as it is written. You don't have to understand it to believe it. Just believe it as it is written. And a good example of that I think is in chapter 7 where it talks about uh, 144,000 Jews being sealed in the end times uh, uh, to do certain work for God. And and uh, I one time went through every commentary I could find. 85% of them said that that was talking about the church. And yes. I thought, they're named by tribes. I mean, yeah. what would God yeah. have to do to convince you? He's talking about 144,000 Jews. You have to put it up in the right. sky and neon lights flashing on. I mean, come on. Okay, Dr. A, you've got to say your favorite statement about biblical interpretation. It's the, the guiding light by which this ministry interprets the Bible. and it's <laughs> Well, it, 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 all of the Bible, not just Bible prophecy. If the plain sense makes sense, don't look for any other sense or you'll end up with nonsense. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Uh, a couple other things. One mm -hmm. is to respect the book. You've got to respect it. And there's a lot of Christians that don't. It's like a second class book in terms of the Bible. Yeah, give me some Romans. You know, there's some real meat. You know, let me read the Gospels. That you can really get a lot. But Revelation, uh, that's for those flakes and nuts that don't have much else to do. Uh, but, but the reality is the same Holy Spirit that inspired Paul to write about justification by faith. The same Holy Spirit that inspired John to sit down and write, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. Also gave John these revelations, these insights, these visions that make up the book of Revelation. And it is valuable. It is good for us. It's healthy. And so you have to respect it. I know one pastor who told me that he went through a series on Daniel, for example, and he went through the first six chapters and then stopped because he didn't want to deal with prophecy. Mm. And a lot of people are that way about Revelation. They'll read Matthew through Jude. And when they get done with Jude, <laughs> bam, right back to Matthew. Mm -hmm. Forget about Revelation. They don't see it as really very valuable. You got a key to any other keys to interpreting this book, understanding it? Sure. I, I think people will get to Revelation and say, well, it's apocalyptic literature. Therefore, it's just filled with symbols. It doesn't make any sense. But I find throughout Revelation, wherever there's a symbol, the Bible then goes ahead and explains it. Yes. Or sometimes you have to go in the Old Testament yeah, yeah. to get a definition. But like, for instance, when Jesus is talking about the, the seven stars and the seven lampstands, just a few verses later, he says in chapter 1 that the lampstands are the seven churches and the stars are the angels that protect those churches. So you got to let the Bible speak for itself. you got to let the Bible interpret for itself. And you have to make allowances for when the Bible's poetic, then accept it as poetic literature. When it's apocalyptic, accept it as apocalyptic literature. You just can't say the Bible is all narrative or all history. You got to understand the literary devices that God uses. Yeah. Okay, well, folks, um, last week we uh, discussed with these uh, fellows uh, some questions concerning the rapture. And if you didn't uh, get that program, you can go to our website at lamblion.com and you can watch it on, online. Uh, I want to come back for a moment to a question concerning the rapture that relates to Revelation. And that is uh, where is the rapture in the book of Revelation? Revelation 3.10, I believe, is the strongest one. Because thou hast kept the word of my perseverance, I will keep you from the hour of testing. That, that hour that's about to come upon the whole world to try and, them and dwell on the earth. And that was Jesus speaking to the church, to Revelation the church at Philadelphia, wasn't it? Or yeah. what, which one was it? Yeah, it was Philadelphia. Philadelphia. In another place, he talks about coming as a thief, and we're to watch and keep our garments so that we don't walk naked. And then at the end, he says, I'm coming quickly. Clearly, that's a charge to the church. Be ready at any time. I could come. So there are hints to it. But that doesn't mean it's going to happen in the chronological order of uh, the tribulation. And sometimes uh, people point to chapter 4, and they say that when uh, John was taken up to heaven, raptured up to heaven, that this was a type of the rapture of the church. Others say they don't really believe that. What, what do you all think about that? I think Why? the biggest example is that there's an absence of the lack of church. I mean, when you look at from chapter 5 oh. to chapter 19, it's all about earth. It's all about Israel. It's all about Gentiles being destroyed. It's all the Antichrist. And the church is not mentioned one time. Yeah, you get to chapter 19, and all of a sudden, you know, the church is in heaven. And, and the focus Earth's of the 20. first three chapters is on the church. Yeah. yeah. And then suddenly, yeah. no mention of the church. Mention saints. Well, is that the yeah. church? Well, clearly there are believers there throughout the tribulation. Uh, but that doesn't mean they're the original batch. Yeah. <laughs> the original batch <laughs> has been snatched, and you got a new batch. <laughs>
Welcome back to Christ in Prophecy and our forum about the book of Revelation. Fellows, let me ask you this question. Is the book of Revelation in chronological order? I think it is. Uh, Revelation 119, therefore the right that the excuse me, write therefore the things which you have seen, the things which are, and the things which shall take place after these things. Things which are, things which shall take place after these things. So, well, I think that in, uh, I would say that in general, overall, it's in chronological order. But I, but I think that in the book of Revelation, there are both flashbacks sure. and flash forwards. Yes. Yeah. Uh, my answer would be yes and no. Yeah. In general, yes. But there are parentheses where you yeah. have God inserting a, a whole concept. You have the parenthesis in Revelation 13 where he talks about the beast and how he gets his start and who his worker is. Well, that's, the, the, the Antichrist shows up a long time before Revelation 13, but God just takes one vision. And really, what we seem to be getting in Revelation are a series of visions that John had, and he's writing them down. Most of them are in order, but there's some where God is just saying, okay, here's the beast. Uh, and you have some other examples as well of uh, this parenthesis where God just inserts a Well, there's almost a, a rhythm thought. where, where uh, the Lord will talk about these uh, the judgments that are coming up on the earth, and they build, and they build, and they build, and, and, and the terror becomes increasing, and then all of a sudden it just cuts off, and there is a parenthesis where he encourages the reader to look forward to the end. We're going to win in the end. It's a, the, the saints are going to come out victorious, and then he'll pick up the narrative again and start talking about an, another tribulation. And yeah. sometimes there is a look backwards. For example, mm -hmm. in right. Revelation yeah. 13, he looks back to the birth of Jesus and starts talking about that. Yeah, you got, you got the woman and the child and the dragon and all those to, things. We're used to flashbacks in modern fiction writing. What we're not used to are flash forwards yeah. because God knows what's going to happen in the future. He can flash forward Amen. and talk about it. And that's where people often don't understand what's going on in the book of Revelation. Well, yeah. Revelation, it can be terrifying. Obviously, we're talking about you know the earth population being decimated, the economies being decimated, the ecology being decimated. It's a terrifying thing. It reminds me when I was a kid and I'd see horror movies and I hated horror movies because I'd be up all night for weeks. And, you know, I'd run out to get popcorn parrot. You needed to take a break. And Revelation does that. You need to take a break from the drama. You need to sit down and Jesus comes in and says, oh, oh wait, don't worry about it. this is a kind of a how it's going to end. I'm going to win. Don't worry. Stick yeah. it out. It's not going to be so bad. And, and we need those throughout Revelation. Now, one of the areas of the book of Revelation where there has been the most speculation has to do with chapter 7 where it talks about 144,000 people. Oh, yeah. Uh, who are those 144,000? Are they Jehovah's Witnesses? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It, it says here in Revelation 7, 4, And I heard the number of those who are sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the Israelites. <laughs> Duh. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and, of course, uh, uh, probably... Almost all Jews, well, not all, but, but most Jews would not be able to tell you what tribe they're from. But God yeah. knows. He has excellent yeah. record keeping in heaven. So he, it would be no problem at all for him to choose from different tribes and, and raise up these individuals. I, I just don't understand why people would interpret this to mean anything other than what it says. Yeah. It's just 104,000 Jews that he's going to give special mission to. And, and One thing but, you have to remember is that God is a communicator. I mean, he knows how to communicate, and it would be foolish for him to write a book out so <laughs> mystical, so bizarre, yeah. so highly symbolic that nobody could get anything out of it. Yeah. It'd be like you inviting me to come on this program, and I spoke fluent Russian the entire time. <laughs> I might be doing very well, but it wouldn't do one thing for your audience. And it wouldn't do anything for us if God made this book so difficult that we couldn't get anything out of it. Uh, there's another dynamic can be mentioned here. Uh, and those 144,000 from the 12 tribes of Israel uh, can bring to mind something that God has operated in the past. What happens in the enterprise of preaching the Word of God when the Holy Spirit falls entirely on a Jewish person. Where would we be without the, the Apostle Paul or some of the other Jewish prophets? When the Holy Spirit gets involved in a Jewish person, then the enterprise of reaching people goes into a hyper gear. Yeah. And God uh, has used for 2,000 years the ministry of the Apostle Paul, just one Jewish man full of the Holy Spirit. There's going to be 144,000 of these guys. Well, that reminds me of a conversation I had one time with Zola Levitt, who uh, has gone on to be with the Lord now, but he's a leading Messianic Jew here in the United States. And I called him and I said, do you, do you believe the 144,000 are going to be real Jews? And he said, well, of course they're going to be real Jews. He said, uh, why do you think God gave us the personality we have? 
Well, I wasn't about to touch that. I said, well, <laughs> so I played dumb. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, haven't you ever met a Jew? And I said, well, yeah. He said, haven't you ever noticed that we're real pushy? I said, well, as a matter of fact, yes. He said, we're the world's greatest salesman. He said, can you imagine God unleashing 144,000 spirit-filled Jews on the world? He said, we're going to convert more people in seven years than the church has in 2,000 years. He said, we're going to push them up in the corner and hold them by the neck until they say Jesus. And I said, well, I hope you're right, brother. That's all right. Well, <laughs> Revelation 11 speaks of two special witnesses of God who are going to be sort of the conscience of the world for the first three and a half years of the tribulation. doesn't say who they are. Who do you think they're going to be? Well, there's a few candidates, uh, obviously. Uh, most people say Elijah because Elijah was the forerunner of Christ. Although I think Jesus pretty much cleared up that Elijah, the forerunner really was John the Baptist. It talks about uh, possibly Moses. Uh, that he might have been raptured, but we read in Joel that he, he did die. So, you know, he's iffy. Enoch uh, was raptured from the earth. So we got two guys in the Old Testament, Elijah and Enoch, who are both raptured. One represents uh, Israel, Elijah, and one Enoch, he was a Gentile, Gentile, before there was even Jews. So he could represent that. Uh, another theory is that it's just two people who are alive at that time period who are gifted, like the 144,000. These have a special ministry. So we don't know for sure, but it, it's... Whoever they are, their power, their abilities, uh, it's like Old Testament prophets all over. They had the ability to shut up the rain, they can call down fire. I mean, they can do everything that the false prophet can do and more so. And they, for three and a half years of the tribulation, they shake the world up so that when they're killed by the Antichrist, the whole world rejoices over their death. Yeah, it's like a Christmas in the middle of the tribulation. People exchange gifts. They're so happy over the killing of these two guys who have been the conscience of the world during this horrible time. Yeah. Well, I think one of them is easily argued that it's Elijah uh, in the book of Malachi, verse chapter 4, verse 5. Because, behold, I'm going to send to you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So well, the, the Jews believe that too. You know, when they hold a Passover meal, they always have an extra chair uh, for Elijah the prophet because they know he's going to come back yes. in the end times. So. Okay, let me ask you this question. Uh, another area of great mystery is the number 666, which people are going to have to have on their hand or their forehead or the, uh, in order to buy or sell. Why 666? What is the symbolism of that? Well, the one clue that is given is uh, John uh, describes it as the number of a man. Mm -hmm. The fact that you have six repeated three times, three is normally the number of God, Father, yes. Son, Holy Spirit. Paul said that the Antichrist will show himself in the temple of God, that he is God. So basically what you have uh, is a man r r acting as God, Satan inhabiting him. Satan has always wanted really two things. One is power and the other is worship. And in the Antichrist, he will have it. He will have power for a very brief time over the whole world, and he will have worship, and he will force that worship, and then all apart from those that put their faith in Christ will give him that worship. So the Antichrist will be a type of the Messiah. The yeah. false prophet will be a type of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And then you've got Satan operating, uh, who is the devil. A and counterfeit so, trinity. Yeah. So you've got a satanic trinity operating, and six is the number of man since that's the day that man was created on. So 666 the ultimate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Welcome back to Christ in Prophecy and our forum on the book of Revelation. Fellas, is there anything in the book of Revelation that you do not understand? <laughs> well, actually, Dave, I am the ultimate expert on Revelation. Send all your... No. Of course, there's lots of stuff we don't understand. <laughs> Uh, to me, one of the simple things that I'd love uh, to know it would be just what it really means to reign with Christ. You know, a lot of times when people talk about our eternity, their idea is you go to heaven, you sing 24-7, nonstop, forever. <laughs> And I have to be honest, Dave, that sounds a little boring to me. I mean, I love worship. I enjoy worship, praising the Lord, but 24-7, really? But the Bible doesn't say we'll sing forever. Yeah. Revelation makes it clear we will reign forever. Yeah. But just what does that mean? Who will we reign over? Yes, if you're going to reign, you've got to reign over you somebody. you reign yeah, over right. somebody. Will there be other worlds that will be involved? I mean, there's so many questions. Jerry, you understand it all? No, uh, absolutely <laughs> not. And I take great comfort in that because the Bible says that we are looking through a glass darkly. Amen. Amen. And, yes. uh, I have license from the Lord not to have to understand it. And I, I don't have to understand everything in the Bible to believe it. That's right. Uh, but one of the things that fascinates me in the book of Revelation is, is in chapter 22, where it says the 
tree of life is placed there in Jerusalem. We're in the millennium. We're 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 at the end of the millennium, and the tree of life is no. Been, that's in the eternal state. Been placed there at the end of the millennium, yeah. and it says that the leaves on the trees are for the healing of the nations. Well, wait a minute! I thought the healing of the nations has already taken place. And it speaks of nations outside the New Jerusalem on the New and, Eternal Earth. And it talks about dogs outside and so, all that kind of stuff. I'm fascinated by that, and I can't explain it. So that is my number one question. You know, I, I look through a mirror darkly, and I have questions. And number one on the list is, who are these nations that appear to be outside the New Jerusalem on the New Earth? Uh, I don't know who they are. But I, if we're going to reign over somebody, we're going to reign over somebody. And, and uh, one thing that's interesting is at the end of the millennium, we're never told what happens to all those who accept Jesus Christ during the millennium. And whether they receive glorified bodies or what happens to them, right. we don't know. Maybe they're put on the earth. I don't know, but that's one of the questions I've got. Amen. Dennis, you've already said you know, understand it all. What about you, Nathan? <laughs> uh, wow, you're so putting me in there. Uh, no, obviously, I don't understand it all. Uh, I don't think it's meant to be understood because when we don't understand, we keep on going in. Well, oh, that's right. Reading, digging and deeper, we keep digging studying. Deeper. Like, for instance, uh, the sixth uh, trumpet judgment, these demonic locusts that come out in the world and they're described as heads of lions and mouths of fire and smoke and sulfur. And, like, say, what? You know, I just don't understand. Is that those people are we talking about? Or are we actually talking demons? And why do they look like animals? Yeah. I mean, there's all sorts of imagery in that that the Bible gives us, yeah. but not always a definition. So. Well, one thing I would point our viewers to is Revelation 1 3, which says, Blessed is, is, is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and heed the things which are written in it, for the time is near. That verse jumped off the page at me many years ago, and I discovered this is the only book of the Bible that promises you right up front you're going to get a blessing if you mm -hmm. read it and heed it. And so I, what I began to do is every time I would read the book, I would pray right up front, Lord, help me to understand it better than I did before, and I would come to understand it better. And I, but, and, but I'm still reading it, still things I don't completely sure. understand, but I get more and more understanding the longer I read, the longer I study, the more I dig, because I pray for that understanding based on that verse. Well, I, I, I absolutely concur. Uh, I was fascinated by that verse years ago when I first started studying Revelation, and it occurred to me one day, and I'd heard this so many times, Blessed is he who reads. Mm -hmm. And that's not what the Bible says. It says, Blessed is he who reads and heeds the, the prophecy of this book. So, what does that mean to heed the prophecy of that book? Yeah. Let me ask you this Is there, when you began to study the book of Revelation as a neophyte, just beginning to really get into it, what was the most amazing thing you discovered in it? What, what surprised you the most? Uh, for me, the Jewishness. That's okay. involved in it. Uh, man, all the quotes from the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures. And then the well, it has more quotations from the Old Testament than the end of the book. Yes. Uh -huh. And then, you know, if you take the Jewishness out of the Revelation, you wouldn't have much Revelation <laughs> left. There's Lion of the Tribe of Judah. It was written by a Jewish prophet named John. Uh, you got the seven, uh, chapter seven with 144,000 witnesses. You got the lion of the tribe of Judah going to come and rule and reign over the whole earth. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, that actually applies to the whole New Testament because uh, uh, Jewish people are told that if they read the New Testament, they will sin. And they're told never to read the New Testament. And yet when they do read it, the thing that amazes them the most is so Jewish mm -hmm. from yes. beginning to end. Yes. The gospel yeah. everything. How about you, Dennis? Anything to surprise Well, there's, you? there's been a couple of surprises down through the years. One of them uh, that I think very few Christians even today uh, really get is just how evangelical a book Revelation is. Mm -hmm. A lot of people see it as mystical, esoteric, uh, bizarre, written for mystical, esoteric, bizarre people. <laughs> <laughs> and of not very much practical use. Uh, and certainly not much related to the idea of receiving Christ. But you find Jesus all over the book. For example, the Lamb of God, that term, you find it four times referring to Jesus outside of Revelation. You find it 28 times in the book of Revelation. You, you can hardly turn a page but what you're reading about the Lamb of God. Uh, you, you find John starting out at the very beginning, say, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Well, that's very evangelical language. You find an angel going out preaching the everlasting gospel. Mm -hmm. So it's not like some separate book away from the rest right. of the New Testament that doesn't emphasize Jesus, doesn't emphasize the need to be born again. It fits perfectly. It's just a prophetic book. So yeah, it's different. 
but the theme is still the same. It's Christ, and it's ultimately His reign and rule over the earth. And Nathan, what about you? Anything surprising? Well, it wasn't what was in it, but what's not in it. And it's, what's not in it is much definition, much description about the eternal state. Yes. I'm just shocked how little we are told. I mean, we're, this life is so little, and eternity is so Basically forever. Basically says two things. We're going to serve God forever, and, and we'll see His face yeah. yeah, which means we'll have intimate fellowship with him. Mm. But more than that, it's not much. Well, the thing that that was most surprising to me when I started studying the Book of Revelation was when I discovered that we're going to spend eternity on a new earth. I had never heard that in my entire life. That we're going to spend eternity in an ethereal place called heaven, floating around clouds, playing harps. No, we're going to be in new bodies on a new earth in a new Jerusalem. It's going to be a tangible existence. Amen. Did you have something you wanted to add? I did. Uh, (laughs) Something that fascinates me still about the book of Revelation is the two pictures of Jesus in Revelation. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah, and yet he is also a lamb. Yes. And we know of lambs as being gentle and that kind of stuff, but God's lamb is full of wrath, the Bible says. (laughs) And it's, you know, hide us from the wrath of the lamb all the way through Revelation. And I'm still working on that. (laughs) (laughs) Well, uh, Keep working, brother. (laughs) Gary, Dennis, it's been great to have you on again, guys. Thank you. you, Learned a lot. Can you share what your website address is so people can reach you, please? Mine would be lionofjudaministry.org. And ours is spiritofgrace.org. Thanks, guys. And hey, could we just sum up this program by one sentence? What is the message of the book of Revelation? Jesus is going to judge, and Jesus is going to reign. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, folks, that's our program for this week, and I hope it's been a blessing to you, and I hope you'll be back with us again next week. Until then, this is Dave Reagan speaking for Lamb and Lion Ministries and for Nathan Jones saying, look up, be watchful, for our redemption is drawing near. If you would like to learn more about the book of Revelation, please consider Dr. David Reagan's comprehensive survey entitled, Wrath and Glory. In this easy-to-read book, Dr. Reagan takes you through the book of Revelation one chapter at a time and clearly explains the meaning of each chapter, relying on a literal, plain-sense interpretation. The book also contains Dr. Reagan's responses to the most commonly asked questions about Revelation. Questions like, is Revelation prophecy or history? Who are the mysterious 144,000 of Revelation? Where is the rapture in the book of Revelation? What is the meaning of the number 666? Will the Antichrist be killed and resurrected? Where will the Antichrist headquarters be located? Is Jesus really going to reign over the earth for a thousand years? Are believers going to live eternally in heaven or on a new earth? Dr. Reagan's book concludes with lessons drawn from the book of Revelation that we can apply to our lives as we try to live for Christ in the end times. This book has been published in more foreign language than any other book Dr. Reagan has written and has consequently had a worldwide impact. You can secure a copy of this book in English or Spanish for a gift of $15 or more plus the cost of shipping. Just call the number you see on the screen between 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. Central Time, Monday through Friday, or you can place your order on our website at lamblion.com. Thank you for joining us on today's Christ in Prophecy, a presentation of Lamb and Lion Ministries, a non-denominational ministry dedicated to teaching the fundamentals of biblical prophecy and proclaiming the soon return of Jesus. 